Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Today we're going to examine how a reactor responds with feedback during a prompt supercritical transient. Doing this is going to get complicated, but this analysis is done in the time domain precisely to demonstrate how complex it is to obtain an analytical solution to a dynamics problem. During a prompt supercritical transient, a reactor's power tends to follow this Gaussian-like shape. We have an initial jump in the power, but eventually feedback kicks in and lowers the reactivity of the system, which causes the power to stop increasing and to peak at some maximum, P sub m, at time T sub m. The system continues to heat up over time after this peak, which causes the reactivity to decrease even further, and causes the power to drop back down from its peak and eventually to approach some new steady-state asymptotic power level. In this lecture, we will obtain several quantities. We want to know how high this power spike is and to develop an expression for the power as a function of time. We also want to develop an expression for the reactivity of the system as a function of time and to see how much energy, delta Q, is released from the system. Lastly, we want to understand at what time, T sub m, the system reaches its maximum power and to solve for delta t, or the approximate width of the transient, or the amount of time it takes for the transient to occur. Let's begin our journey by discussing reactivity feedback. Feedback describes how a system's output affects its input. An example of this is how going faster on a bicycle generates more wind resistance and makes it even more difficult to go even faster. Another example is how nuclear reactors become less reactive as they heat up. Feedback effects in reactors are generally caused by Doppler broadening, which increases the fuel's rate of parasitic neutron capture, or because the fuel expands as it heats up, which then increases neutron leakage due to the increased surface area of the fuel, or because the increased heat generation in the reactor causes its moderator to boil away or to otherwise decrease in density. Reactivity feedback coefficients describe how changes to some system parameter affect a system's eigenvalue or reactivity. Essentially, they are like sensitivity coefficients for the reactivity with respect to the system's temperature or, for example, to its power. These reactivity coefficients can have units of dollars per degree Fahrenheit or Celsius or dollars per megawatt second or dollars per full power second or whatever is convenient for describing our system. During the transient, we will assume that the power's reactivity is equal to its initial reactivity, rho 1, plus gamma, the reactivity feedback coefficient, times the integral of the system's power since the start of the transient. This power integral is equal to the amount of energy released during the transient, which is converted to a change in reactivity by multiplying it by this feedback coefficient, gamma. This equation assumes that all of the energy generated in the system stays in the system, which actually is a pretty reasonable assumption, even with a reactor with circulating coolant due to the extremely short length of these prompt supercritical transients. Also, this expression assumes that gamma is negative, which is a matter of convention. If we plot the reactivity as a function of time, we see that it starts off level while the system's power is still low, and then it decreases quickly throughout the transient as the reactor heats up, and eventually it asymptotes as the reactor's power drops back down towards its initial level. The inflection point for this curve occurs at Tm, which is the time when the system's power reaches its maximum value. At this time, the reactivity in the system is exactly equal to beta effective. Now if we remember our definition of the prompt reactivity, we see that at Tm, the prompt reactivity is equal to zero. This means that after the peak power occurs, the system is no longer prompt supercritical, which causes the system's power to decrease quickly. So given our expression for the reactivity, and given that the prompt reactivity is equal to zero at time tm, we see that at time tm, our gamma times power integral must equal our initial prompt reactivity, or rho p1. If we recall that the power integral is also equal to the amount of energy released by the transient, we see that the energy released during the first half of the transient, which is the time it takes for the reactor's power to go from its initial power to its peak power, is simply equal to negative rho p1 divided by gamma sub e, which is gamma in units of dollars per megawatt second, or dollars per full power second. This is something interesting and counterintuitive about the transient. 
the energy released during the first half of the transient, and spoiler alert, throughout the entire transient, is not a function of lambda or the reactor's initial power. It only depends on rho P1 and the system's feedback coefficient. One might expect that the energy released by this transient depends on the system's power, but alas, that is not true. Now we'll start down the long road towards developing an expression for the system's power and reactivity. Recalling our definitions for the energy released by the transient and the time-dependent reactivity, we can take the derivative of both sides, or all sides in this case, and develop an expression for d rho dt as a function of power. After taking the second derivative of this expression, we develop an expression that relates the second order derivative of the reactivity to the first order derivative of the power. We can substitute this expression for d power dt into the prompt kinetics approximation. We can also substitute in our expression for p of t and develop a second order differential equation involving only the time dependent reactivity. After a change of variables, we can integrate this expression from time zero to time t, and we now have a first order differential equation for rho sub p. We recall the initial conditions that at time zero, rho sub p is equal to rho p1, and that d rho p dt at time zero is equal to gamma times the adjusted p zero, which we get by taking the derivative of our reactivity expression, Note that our initial power is the prompt kinetics approximation's adjusted initial power. And we arrive at this first order differential equation for the reactivity. From here, we can actually solve for PM. Recalling that d rho p dt is equal to gamma times p of t, we substitute in the power into this equation and evaluate the expression at time t equals tm. This turns our p of t term into p sub m, and our rho of t term into zero, and thus the change in the reactor's power from the start of the transient to its peak power is equal to negative rho sub p one squared divided by two lambda gamma sub e. Since the maximum power is usually much, much greater than the initial power, this means that our maximum power is approximately equal to negative rho p one squared divided by two lambda gamma e. This means that the maximum power during the transient is inversely proportional to lambda and gamma e, and that it is not a function of the system's initial power. The starting power has almost no impact on a reactor's maximum power during a prompt supercritical transient. There are several ways we could decide how long the transient lasts, but one simple way of saying when the transient has ended is to find the time T2, when the reactor's power has returned to its original power from the start of the transient, which is the adjusted P0. Because the power at time T2 is equal to the reactor's initial power, this means that the left-hand side of this equation is equal to zero, which implies that the reactivity at time T2 must equal plus or minus rho P1, the initial prompt reactivity. The power is equal to the adjusted P0 at the very start and at the very end of the transient. Since we know that the reactivity is equal to rho p1 at the start of the transient, this means that our reactivity at time t2 at the end of the transient must equal negative rho p1. If we plot the actual reactivity as a function of time, this is exactly the behavior that we see. The prompt reactivity starts off at rho p1, it reaches zero and then becomes negative after time tm, and then it settles down towards an asymptotic value of negative rho p1. This means that the overall change in reactivity during the transient is equal to negative two times rho p1. And recalling that this power integral is equal to the energy release by the transient, we see that this total energy release is simply equal to negative two times rho p1 divided by gamma e. So the total amount of energy released by the transient is again not a function of its initial power or its neutron generation time, but instead only a function of rho p1 and gamma e. Now, at last, let's solve for p of t and rho of t. We'll take our previous first order differential equation for rho of t and recast it by defining 
rho sub b squared, which is equal to rho p1 squared minus 2 times lambda gamma times the adjusted p0. From here, we rearrange our differential equation into this form and integrate both sides from time t prime is equal to 0 to t prime is equal to t. This integration is a little complicated, but after some handy logarithmic identities, we see that t over lambda is equal to this interesting combination of logarithmic functions. If we recall that rho sub p is equal to 0 at time tm, then we can develop an expression for tm based on our reactivity insertions. Next, we rearrange terms to develop an expression for t minus tm as a function of rho p of t, and then we can solve for rho p of t. After we combine this quote-unquote simple expression for rho p of t with our previous first-order differential equation for rho of p, then we can solve for the reactor's power function, which we find is equal to pm divided by the hyperbolic cosine, or cosh, of rho b divided by 2 lambda times t minus tm, all squared. Gee, wasn't that easy? Lastly, we can solve for the time width of the transient by defining a delta t that equals 1 over pm times the integral of p of t throughout the transient. This power integral is again equal to delta q, which is equal to negative rho p1 over gamma e. We could substitute in our expression for 1 over pm, but a more useful approach is to apply this identity that 1 over pm is equal to 1 over pm minus the adjusted p0 times 1 minus the adjusted p0 divided by pm. Substituting in our expression for pm and going through some algebraic exercise, gives that delta t is equal to 4 times lambda times 1 over rho p1 times 1 minus the adjusted power divided by pm. Since pm is much, much greater than the adjusted initial power, this means that our delta t is roughly equal to 4 lambda over rho p1. So our transient's duration is weakly dependent on the power, not at all dependent on gamma, and mostly just dependent on lambda and rho p1. Actually, the transient's length is directly proportional to lambda. So in summary, we found that the transient's duration is directly proportional to lambda, its maximum power is inversely proportional to lambda, and that the amount of energy it releases is not dependent on lambda whatsoever. So, for example, comparing a fast system to a thermal system, we see that our fast system, which has a significantly smaller lambda value, will experience much shorter transients, but then it will also reach much higher maximum powers. However, the amount of energy released by the transient, be it a fast transient or a thermal transient, doesn't rely on the speed at which the neutrons travel or are generated in the system, but rather on the magnitude of the system's feedback coefficient and the size of the initial reactivity insertion. So in summary, we have developed an understanding for the duration, the maximum power, and the energy released by prompt supercritical transients. And all it took was some clever assumptions, some obscure logarithmic identities, and a ton of algebra. One of our goals in performing this perhaps frustrating derivation was to demonstrate exactly how difficult it can be to solve for a reactor's dynamic behavior for one particular transient. This approach is not very generalizable, especially if some of our assumptions, such as the adiabatic condition, are not true. In the following lectures and throughout the rest of this course, we will transition into the dynamics portion of this class, which will provide a simplified and much more flexible approach for understanding a reactor's dynamic behavior.